Hi. So today I want to talk about scattering experiments and in this lecture I'm going to focus on hard sphere scattering. So collision theory, in collision or scattering experiments, they're actually the single most powerful tool that we have for investigating the structure of atomic and subatomic objects. And in this type of experiment, you fire a stream of projectiles, like electrons or protons, at target objects like atoms or nuclei. And of course, this is what's going on at CERN and at other super colliders where they're studying the structure of subatomic particles. Now, it's easiest, perhaps, to understand hard sphere scattering, because in hard sphere scattering, you have a projectile incident on a hard sphere, and they're making actual physical contact. So this is easier to visualize than things like the Coulomb force repulsion and other types of forces, which act um, and scatter particles even though those particles aren't touching. So I'm going to go through hard sphere scattering here. Um, the equations that we'll go through and the parameters that we'll describe will be the same types of equations and parameters that you'll see in more complex scattering, but maybe you'll be able to wrap your head around it a little bit better. So looking at this image, you see a hard sphere target and then you see a little tiny projectile that's basically a point particle. And it's incident on it, coming from the left, moving towards the right, strikes the sphere and then scatters off at some angle theta. Now, we're going to define what's known as the impact parameter. I'm going to use the uh, variable b to describe the impact parameter. And b is the perpendicular distance from the projectile's incoming straight line path to a parallel axis through that target center. It would be the distance of closest approach if there were no other forces on the projectile. And if b is equal to zero, then that would be a head-on collision. Now, looking at the angle theta, the maximum possible value for theta is 180 degrees. And of course, the minimum possible angle would be zero if the particle didn't even touch the uh, uh, target at all. Now, in particle experiments, what you do is you measure a scattering angle. You have some kind of detector, and you know what the angle is to that detector from where your target is. Now, sometimes it's a big detector, and sometimes you can move the detector around. This is the kind of thing that you can measure, but it's really not easy to measure the impact parameter. That would mean that you had to measure the thing before it even touched your target, which would be kind of hard. Now, to give you an idea about some old school type detectors that people had, um, here is the simplest kind that you can get, a proportional counter. Now, a proportional counter is a type of gaseous ionization detector device, and it's used to measure particles of ionizing radiation. And the key feature in proportional counters is the ability to measure the in energy of an incident radiation by producing a detector output that's proportional to the radiation energy. Basically, what you have if you have a source of particles, it's incident. It goes through the windows. Some of those windows are shown here in this little graphic, okay? And then <clears throat> what happens is the ionizing radiation comes in. It's attracted to the uh, anode and then creates a current pulse uh, in between the anode and the cathode in that wire, okay? Now, suppose a projectile hits a hard sphere of radius R. If the projectile hits the target, it's going to bounce off and emerge in a different direction. Now, if you knew the impact parameter B, you could figure it all out. But if you don't, um, just one collision won't really help. You're going to have to have a lot of collisions to fully understand the target. In other words, you could visualize like taking a pie or something, like a food fight, and throwing it at some target, okay? Now, let's say that for some reason you're blindfolded and you can't really see the target. And then after the experiment is over, they move the target after away. It would be like trying to figure out what the target looked like by, you know, looking at the food splatter on the wall. So that's basically what we're trying to do here. Now, in order to have a lot of collisions, you can do one of two things. You can have a lot of targets in a single assembly and fire a beam of a lot of projectiles instead of just a few projectiles, right? So in our case, we're going to do both. We're going to have a lot of incoming projectiles, and we're going to have a lot of targets. And that will give us <clears throat> information uh, in a shorter period of time about what our targets look like. Okay? So that's kind of what's going on in these balloon games, right? <laughs> Except maybe instead of throwing one ball at a time at those clowns that are mocking me, I have a machine gun, and I just shoot at the clowns, right? Maybe then I could hit one. So let's go through some of the math of what's going to happen here. 
Now, of course, the probability that something is going to be scattered off these targets is proportional to how big the targets are, right? So the way that we parameterize that is we talk about the target density, which I'll call N sub tar, and that's the number of targets that you have per unit cross-sectional area. So when I say a cross-sectional area, imagine that you take a picture or a snapshot of your targets. So that's a two-dimensional projection of your targets, and you're just looking at how much area they take up in your snapshot. Now we'll call A the total area of our target assembly. In this case, it's this little rectangle, and it would be the length times the width of that little rectangle that's pictured. And we'll call sigma the cross-section of each target as seen from the front. In this case, my targets are all spheres, so the cross-section of each target as seen from the front would be pi r squared, where r is the radius of those little spheres. Now, <clears throat> if you multiply n sub tar times A times sigma, then that's the total area of all your targets. Right? In that case, you're number, multiplying the number of targets per area times the area, so that gives you the total number of targets, and then you're multiplying that times the area of each target, so that gives you the total area of all the targets. Now, the probability that you're going to have a scattering event is going to be equal to the total area of all your targets divided by the total area, right? Because, of course, it's more likely to scatter off of a target if those targets take up more of the cross-sectional area in your image. Now, if you cancel out the area on the top and the bottom of that equation, then that gives us the probability of a scattering event is equal to n sub tar times sigma. Now, you could also measure the probability by performing the experiment. If you do that, then the probability of scattering is going to be equal to the total number of particles that are scattered divided by the total number of particles that you shot at your target. I'm going to define this as n scattered divided by n incident, or n sub sc divided by n of I and C. So that's also equal to your probability. And so you can then set those things equal. You can set N scattered divided by N incident equal to N sub tar times sigma and use that information to solve problems. So that's what we're going to do in the next example. Now sometimes you might measure a rate or a scattering rate and that would be dN dt and that's more useful sometimes. And so you could do that and take the derivative of N. The unit, by the way, that they use for cross-sections, which is proportional to the likelihood, of course, of a scattering event, is a barn. So this is the unit that they use um, for scattering events from uh, small particles. Now, if you think about it, the, the cross-section or the radius of a nucleus would be about a femtometer or 10 to the minus 14 meters to 10 to the minus 15 meters. And so if you square that, you're going to get something on the order of 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. And that's a barn. One barn is equal to 10 to the minus 28 meters squared. It's a very small cross-sectional area. <clears throat> but physicists have a good sense of humor. And so the name the barn comes from the idea that it's as big as a barn. So it's a joke. <laughs> Let me do an example from Taylor's Classical Mechanics, which is a great resource, by the way, for understanding scattering. If 10,000 neutrons are fired through an aluminum foil that's 0.1 millimeter thick, and the cross-section of the aluminum nucleus is about 1.5 barns, then how many neutrons are going to be scattered, given that the density of your aluminum is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter? Okay, so here we go. The probability is equal to n sub tar times sigma. Now, n sub tar is the number of scattering um, targets per unit cross-sectional area. Now, let's say that instead of that, we know how uh, we have a three-dimensional thing, for aluminum, we know the density, so that means that we can figure out the number of aluminum nuclei per unit volume. But we want the number of aluminum nuclei per unit cross-sectional area, so we're going to multiply times the thickness. So what we'll get is we'll first find the number of aluminum nuclei per unit volume. To do that, we're going to use the density of the aluminum. So the density of the aluminum is 2.7 grams per cubic centimeter. We're going to convert from uh, cubic centimeter to cubic meter by multiplying by 100 cubed, right? And then we're going to use the atomic weight of aluminum, which is about 27 grams per mole. We're going to use that to convert from grams to moles. And then we're going to use Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, to convert from moles to atoms, or nuclei. So that gives us the number of nuclei per unit volume. 
And then we're going to multiply that times the thickness, which is 0 0.0001 meters, in order to obtain the number of target nuclei per unit cross-sectional area. And that gives us 6 times 10 to the 24th inverse meters squared. Now, that gives us NTAR, and we multiply NTAR times sigma in order to get the probability. So that's 6 times 10 to the 24th times 1.5 times 10 to the minus 28, which was the cross-section of the aluminum nucleus. That gives us a probability of 0 0.0009. Now what we need is we need the number scattered if the number incident is 10,000. Well remember, n incident divided by, or, or n scattered divided by n incident gives us the probability, so I can fault solve for the number scattered by multiplying 0 0.0009 times the number of particles incident, 10,000, and get 9. Okay, so actually nine neutrons are scattered from an aluminum foil target that's 0.1 millimeters thick in this case. All right, so that's hard sphere scattering um, and an example of hard sphere scattering. I hope you understood that. Um, if not, ask me about it in class and I'll see you later.